I came here today primarily to congratulate all of you, and not just the ones who are on the stage, because all of you are winners, and all of you should be up here, and I congratulate all of you, because that's why you're here, because of what you do. Congratulations. I asked the management whether we could afford this or not. And they assured me we could. Because you're doing such a good job and the business is doing well. And so we have much to celebrate today. But most of all, I celebrate your love and your friendship and all the years that we have grown to know the beauty and the wonders and the talents of the people of Malaysia. It has been always a highlight for me to come to Malaysia. And you, my memories from meeting your prime minister when he spoke to one of our meetings, to Jerry and Angela being honored by the king of your country and becoming a Datu Sir Jerry, Datu Sherry, uh, Jerry. You know, I hardly know what to call the guy anymore. <laughs> but I'm just going to call him my friend Jerry, if it's okay. But if it wasn't Jerry for Jerry's persistence and faithfulness and loyalty to the Amway business during difficult times, I don't know where we would be today. And so I thank him and many others for that. Sonny, it's good to see you again. And uh, we love you. And I remember us flying together from someplace to someplace uh, on one of our journeys out your way. So my memories are many. And some of you, many of you weren't around the day you mobbed us at the airport in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I think the prime minister of your country was jealous of that. Uh, and he probably still is. <laughs> because he said to me, nobody ever came out to the airport to meet me like that. <laughs> and that was undoubtedly a record for that whole country, to see that many people come to say hello to one person. And so that's one of my special memories as well. <laughs> so we thank you for that. <laughs> but while we talk of wonderful memories and great achievements and loyal staff and the struggles in a strange country and your struggles with the language barriers and labeling and product supply and all the different challenges that we have met. I really would like to talk to you today a little bit about overcoming what I think is one of the biggest problems. Now, I'm an old guy now. I'm out of the business. My body is 74. My heart is 42. My average age, therefore, is 59. But when I try to say things to you as leaders, I recognize the challenges you have to overcome and that you have had to overcome just to get here. But as the business matures, sometimes our leadership forgets what they did to get here. And it's important for me and for you to remember what we had to overcome. A lot of that was fear. And my subject really is fear. Overcoming the fears of life. The fear you had to overcome of going into Amway and what other people would say if you got in Amway. The fear of selling and you had to overcome that and the resistance of people who said the price was too high or the product wasn't good. But all over the world are people who are afraid to sell. 
And they say, oh, I can't sell. But a lot of you said that too. And a lot of you felt that way once too. But you overcame that fear, didn't you? And so it is with the fear of where this company is going. Because oftentimes when the business has setbacks, I wonder what's going to happen. And the fear of change comes in on us. And the old guys are gone. And Doug and Dick are there. And so that's a change. But as we get older, those are good changes. But it's important to recognize the passage of time. But remember, as we work on overcoming our fears, our personal fears, our corporate fears, the fears of our own destiny, our own health, our fears we have to deal with also as to how we feel and what our health is like. I see Jerry's even limping now. Uh, it's okay, going to be all right, huh? I remember once I came to Malaysia. I, did, I shouldn't tell this story. I had a hernia. You know what a hernia is? Huh? Down here, you know, Jerry. So all the time I was speaking, I spoke with my hand in my pocket to hold my hernia in. Some people said, get your hand out of your pocket. And I said, I can't. <laughs> I guess that's not translating very well. It's okay. <laughs> Only Jerry knows. <laughs> He'll tell you sometime in your language. <laughs> but those were fears all the time. Now, the best way I can help you understand overcoming fears is to take you through the fears and the challenges that we have gone through so that you'll understand that this business is built on solid ground. The United States government challenged the rights of individuals to sell vitamins. And our companies fought a long war with the government. When doctors and most people all over the world said you do not need vitamins, we went out and said you do. And so we overcame that fear. Many distributors quit because of what their doctors said about you don't need vitamins. And now the whole world knows you need vitamins. So it took courageous people. So it took courageous people like us and like you to overcome those fears. And even today, to convince people that they need better nutrition. Because they're either unknowing or they're afraid of what they might take. Or they don't value their health. So our crusade is to help them understand what they can do to help themselves by taking better nutritional products like Neutralite. I know some of you are at Neutralite for several days. I think three days just last week. Last week, yes. We were there yesterday. They told us about your visit and how much they enjoyed having you there. And they told us how much they thought you learned from being there. One of the souvenirs they showed to us yesterday was a smashed pack of cigarettes. Because as they talked to some of you about having better health, somebody in this crowd became convinced they should quit smoking. And so that smashed pack of cigarettes was left on the seat because somebody just smashed it and says, I quit. That's part of the crusade of what we're all about in helping people discover how to live better and to take better care of themselves. You know, it isn't always a matter of just living longer. It's just a matter of living better and healthier while you're here. And so that's what we're all about. You know, Jay and I started in Neutralite 50 years ago, 51 years ago. Now we celebrate 20 years in Malaysia, but 51 years ago, we bought a sales kit, just like you bought a sales kit. 
And we went out and start presenting neutrally. And we were laughed at and ridiculed just like you. Well, we didn't stop, did we? And neither did you. And I'm trying to establish that it takes courageous people to overcome fear and these challenges. And as you do that, you get stronger and stronger. And so that you can meet bigger challenges as they come ahead of us. Business and life is a constant challenge. There is no end to the challenges you will face. People that you think right now are going places in your group, somebody may quit tomorrow. And when you get home, you'll learn that they quit for some reason. Somebody scared them off. But that means you replace them. And so our business is one, like somebody asked me at a seminar I did a couple of days ago, he said, what is a leader? Like all of you are, what is a leader? Are they made, are they created by God that way? Is it something you can learn? Yes, and yes, they're both right. But leadership, in my experiences, is something we do by talking and working with a lot of people, and what we do is discover leadership in people. We can't make people leaders, in my opinion. Yes, God certainly puts some of that in us, some people, but they don't even know they have it. And a lot of you never knew you had leadership ability till you found this business. Then you discovered that people would listen to you and would follow you and would believe you. And one day you said, you know, I'm a leader. So it's an age of discovery. And as you sponsor people, you can't make somebody a leader who doesn't want to go out and sell or won't make a phone call and recruit somebody or won't come to a meeting. You are not good enough to go make them something. You only discover those. And so what you know in the way of overcoming that rejection is you just keep talking to more and more people until you discover them. We're in the discovery business. If I knew how to make a leader, I'd go down to the poorest part of Kuala Lumpur and make them all leaders. But I can't do that. I just have to talk to everybody, and one day somebody says, okay, and they make a sale, and they make a recruiting meeting, and they recruit somebody, and all of a sudden they become a direct one day because they took upon themselves that responsibility. So leadership is a part of our discovery process. Now, once we understand that, then the fear of somebody dropping out disappears because then we just replace them. But we don't allow our business or our life to be controlled by what one other person does or says about you. And so oftentimes we do. Now, we've had a whole ru run through the United States, mostly in the United States, of people telling their distributors because they're afraid to sell, their answer is, you don't have to sell. I must tell you, that's the wrong answer. Because if you tell them they don't have to sell, they may get in, but they will never have a business. They might have a game. They might have a whole lot of names who buy training materials, who spend their money buying things, but they will never make money. And our goal is to help everybody who joins us make money, not learn to spend money. And that means you face 
people who say, oh, I can't sell. And you say, let me show you how. And you take them by the hand and you teach them and show them and watch them. And then you discover that person because you put some time in them. And you help them overcome their fear. Now, some of you, as you get bigger in the business, then you worry about business. And what's the company going to do? You know what the company's going to do? The company's going to go on. This is not, and I want to help you overcome a fear, this is not a business built around Rich DeVos or Jay Van Andel. This is a business about a plan created by us, by the power of God, to empower people around the world to improve themselves. That's what we are. When the business becomes built around the individual, it is a wrong business and a weak business. Because the plan can go on forever. Our responsibility is to make sure the people like Jim and others who administer this plan protect the foundations of the plan so that the commitments made in the plan go on forward. You know, as, as the business went through changes, and sometimes Jerry, sometimes Fu, sometimes Sonny, sometimes Chan would say, you ought to do this, you ought to change that. And they talked to us and, you know, some of those things they suggested we were able to do. But sometimes they wanted us to undo things that were done in the plan. And we said, we will not undo the plan. We will only improve the plan, even though when we look back, we know some of those things probably aren't quite right. Well, just because they aren't quite right for the new crowd doesn't mean we can undo them for those who bought into this plan when they were designed that way. Because as we go along in the business, we always look at how it works better for me. And sometimes when you watch people do things in the plan and in their side issues of the business, they don't share the money amongst all the people. They just take the money for a few people at the top. But in the Amway business, it's a PVBV business so that it is shared all the way down the line. Not just skewed to somebody who might want it. Now those are principles we follow in the line. In the Amway business, we protect the lines of sponsorship. I know in the tape and book business, they don't honor that always. And that, I'm not arguing that point. I can't control that. I can control something else, and that is we honor the lines of sponsorship in the Amway business. That's to protect those who aren't quite so vocal or quite so strong in doing things, because if you don't do that right, then the smaller direct gets lost and their rights get violated. So I come to you today to assure you that you can forget that fear and don't worry about that, okay? Those are things we protect. And they aren't always the best thing to build the business or to recognize somebody. But when we started in Malaysia, we probably had five ways you could make money. And today we probably have a dozen ways that you can make money. We have, it seems to me, a hundred ways you can get rewarded and recognized. We give you a penny for just standing up. Sometimes you can get a pin just for coming to a meeting. <laughs> That's okay. 
part of our business is rewarding. Another part of our business is recognizing. Recognizing the importance of the individual at every level in the business. Because all of us in this room were created by God, and in our view, they are equally important to all of us. I had a lady come to me one day who was a distributor I had sponsored, and she came in the office and she was a direct distributor. We had the big company and big offices, and I came downstairs, there she was. I said, Ruth, how are you? And she said, I didn't think you'd even remember me. I'm only a direct. I said, Ruth, I don't care what pin you wear. You're no less important to me. I don't respect you because of your pin. I respect you for who you are. You're a part of our organization. It isn't what you do, but who you are. Being a part of this organization at any level is important. And I know people say, diamonds where it's at. Well, there may be something up there that diamonds where it's at. But there's a whole lot of ats other places in the business. And sometimes the at is just having friends who when you're sick will pray for you and come over to see you and to help you. That's where it's at. That's the comradeship and fellowship that builds our business. This is not just a business for money. Yes, it, you can make money. But the main thing you make in this business along with that are friends. And for a lot of people who are lonely in this world, this is a business of friendship. And then out of that, you begin to make money as well. But it's all built on having as much respect for the one you sponsor as you have for the one who sponsored you. Now, those are things I share with you so you don't get afraid of the changes that come because this business is designed for the generations, not just for us. And so the things we do are all done carefully to protect those who came 25 years ago and those who will come in 25 years from now. This plan is just as good today as it was for Jerry and Angela when they joined 25 years ago. Everybody says, I should have got in at the beginning. Oh, really? If you'd gotten in on the beginning, you might have quit a long time ago because <laughs> it was a lot tougher than it is today. And so you come today surrounded by a successful history, and you build on that history. And I know a lot of plans, because of the way the plans are written, favor those who got in at the beginning. But anybody who joins Amway today has just as good an opportunity to be where Chan is, a better opportunity to be where Chan is than Chan did when he came in. Very important, because everybody thinks, I should have got in on the ground floor, so I'm not going. I have all sorts of people tell me that. Oh, I should have got in in the beginning. I said, what difference does it make? It's not when you get in, it's what you do after you get in. And that's an excuse, a fear that I should have got in then. And you got all sorts of friends like I do who said, oh, uh, it's too late now. They don't comprehend the magnificence of this plan. And you will have to work to overcome that. But some of those people don't really want to get in anyway. 
they can't compete with you, so they're not going to start. Now I want to share a little bit about me because of those fears I've had to overcome and the fear of rejections that we live with in life, that all of us live with. People who rejected you when you got in the business and who stopped being your friends because you got in this business. And you all must have some like that. I know I do. I still have people who act that way. Now, many, many years ago when I had my first heart attack, my first bypass surgery, my body began to reject me. And we got some surgery and my body did pretty good then. And so we over overcame that rejection by taking some pain. And oftentimes there's pain in overcoming the rejection of your friends or of your body or of your distributors or of others you know. Oh, rejection, there are two things I think are the, are the most difficult things to handle. Fear of rejection and jealousy. As an experienced old guy, jealousy or envy are two things I found are important. I have a little line that says, most of the problems of the world are caused by comparison. I spend too much of my time comparing myself with somebody else or with somebody in a different part of the world and say, oh, they do this, or we do that, and they do this, and they got a house with, bigger than we have, and we got a smaller car, and we spend all of our time comparing ourselves. Try to stop worrying about where you stand in relationship to somebody else. When I was a young boy, we were very poor, just like many of you. But I never envied or was jealous of the other people in the other end of town who had a car or had a nicer home or a job because my father was unemployed. All we said was, if they can do it, we can do it. That's all. And we're going to go to work and work harder so we can do better and improve our condition. That's what you've done. So I'm going to go to work to improve our condition. And now you can keep doing that. So that's a problem. Don't worry about that one. But you know, I was getting rejected by my body. And then about 10 years ago, I had a stroke. My left side is still paralyzed to some extent. That's why they give me the old man a chair once in a while. That's why I'm not walking around the stage like I used to, because I'm a little unsteady because of a stroke. And my hand is numb. But just like all of you who have certain things in your body that aren't working quite right, that's okay. You just walk and keep going. And we all got something. But we don't let that control us, do we? But our body is rejecting us a little. So I got a stroke, and then a bad heart attack, and then another bypass surgery, and then a bad staph infection, which almost killed me. That was worse than the heart attack, I think. Although when I went to the hospital for the bypass, the doctor said, well, we'll wait to operate till morning. If he's living in the morning, will operate. But he didn't think I would make it through the night. That's how bad my heart was at that time. But the Lord kept me alive till morning. And so he operated and bypassed. And I lived then for some time. But I had a bad staph infection because I lost all of my breastbone at that time. Because when you have staph, it's like battery acid. 
it ate up the breastbone. So I, my chest bones were in two pieces. And I lived with that until I had my heart transplant. And then he was able to pull it back together. But that was okay. We came through that too. Prayer of my friends and of many of you was a part of that healing process. And I thank you for that as well. But my heart kept failing, and I stopped traveling, stepped out of my office. Dick took over. The kids were growing up, and so I start walking slowly and more carefully. Helen took, took charge of my calendar, and she told me what I could do and when I had to take a nap. And so we did like that. And then the doctors came to our house, when I was 70 years old, and they said, we think you have one year to live unless we can get you a new heart. You are suffering congestive heart failure, and you will be gone in a year. However, he said, I think I know where to send you where you might be able to get a heart. Now, by this time, he had called every heart transplant center in the United States and been rejected by all of them. And they said, he's too old, he's too sick, he's a diabetic, he's too high risk. Besides, we don't have enough hearts anyway, so we won't consider him. So just like you when you built your business and you had meetings and people didn't come and rejected you, we got rejected. You know, I always say to people, when, when you're trying to sell something, a product or an idea, and you get rejected, sometimes you say, they're rejecting me. Usually they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting your idea or your product. But your newer distributors always take that as a personal rejection. Oh, I can't do it. But that's not what it means. Anyway, we got rejected. But he said there was one doctor in London who might consider you because you are AB positive blood type. And he said sometimes he has an extra heart. And so they sent me to London. He made no promise he would take me. He knew all about me physically. He had all the x-rays and MRIs and scans and blood tests. He had all of it. And he could have taken it from that and said yes or no. And he said, no, I want to meet him. And so we flew to London. Helen and I moved into the hotel. We said, we're staying. We're going to get a heart. He hadn't said he'd give us a heart yet. But he was the only one left in the world. Maybe you feel that way sometimes when you're trying to sponsor, huh? That's the way you feel sometimes. But then you've got to feel like we did. He's going to take us. The next one. We're going to find the next one. huh? And so we went to see him. And I'll tell you why. And he told Dick, he said it would take four days to examine him and see if we can give him a new heart. And so we got to the hospital and we started visiting with the doctor and two hours later he says, okay, I'll see if I can get you a new heart. The kids are going to, wow. He said it's going to take several days and here he is saying, okay. I was there a couple months ago and I talked to him again to double check. And I said, why did you say you would take me? And he said, well, I saw something in you that told me you could go through this procedure, that you had the inner strength you needed. <laughs> he said, it just seemed to me you had purpose in your life. You knew who you were. You knew where you came from. You knew you, you could do things yet. You, you had a reason to live. He said, in talking to you, I detected that. You, you had something about you. Now, you see, I know what that something is. See, that is the Spirit of God in me. And if you know God, it's in you. 
And that's why you can overcome rejection. Because you have what it takes to go through that. And as a Christian, see, I know who I am. And it was okay if I died. I was ready for that. And it was okay if I lived. I was prepared for that. But he said, you had something about you. And you see, that is why you are in this room today. Because you have something about you which overcomes all those rejections. And remember that when you're down. And you're down to the last one. Because you have it. You've overcome so much that you have proven that you have the ability to go on. Now, he accepted me. We waited five months. In that five months, I went to the hospital every Monday morning. They checked me every day, every Monday. They checked to see if I was going, how long I could live without going into the hospital. And they determined my heart had been so badly damaged that I needed a very special heart, a strong right side heart. So I not only needed an unusual blood type, and a tissue match, and a size match, but a special, strong, right side heart. A normal heart from a normal person would not have worked in me. But the Lord put in that very same hospital a woman who had bad lungs, who was AB positive, and whose heart God designed for me. How else do you explain? that she would be in that very same hospital at that very same time when I was running out of time. And so they said to her, if we can find you a new heart and lung, may we have your heart. Because they knew it would work in me. And so it was that they got a new heart and lung for her from the continent. And along with a strong right side and a blood type and a tissue match and a right size heart, all that stuff, it had to be a heart that nobody in the United Kingdom could use at that point in time. Because I was a foreigner. I was last on the list. And so at that time, nobody else could use that heart. And my doctor told me that heart would not have worked in anybody else. Anyway, he said it would have died in a bucket. That's the way they speak of it. I would have put it in the bucket and it would have died there. Because you can only wait four hours from when you remove a heart until it's up and running. And so I received that new heart and went on from there. A few days after my operation, I'm walking down a hall. A woman comes out of her room and says, did you get a new heart on June too? And I said, yes. She says, you have my heart. And so we had a big hug and a kiss and a rejoicing together about the miracle of God in our lives. But you see, it all comes with that Spirit of God that is in you to overcome rejection and fear and to take on new challenges. Now, I live with rejection every day. I take a pill for it. I, somewhere it's in here. My hand's a little numb, so I can't always feel. It's a little... Anyway, it's a nice little package. Oops, that's the cufflink. That's not the thing I needed. Wrong shirt today. <laughs> but I take a little medicine. Two little pills a day. Not Neutralite. I take that too. What, well, you want to see that, Jerry? Here, these are my Neutralites, so I'll just keep those over here. But I want you to know I take that too. Anyway. <laughs> How do you overcome rejection? I take a pill for it. I have the power of God in me, just like you. But I also overcome fear by doing the things I fear. And I also overcome fear by prayer. 
and I have a new book I've written all about this. So faith will over your, help you overcome fear. And my new book is called Hope from My Heart. And we will have a copy for all of you a little bit later. Thank you, everybody.